the last thing that we finished up with. Did we finish up with um, Psalms 149, verse 3? Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the sound with the psaltery. Praise Him and harp. That's what I've marked. I got my lines on in between. Verse 4 is praise Him with the timbrel and dance, stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Is that where we stopped? Okay. So let me just reiterate a little bit about that, everything that's being said. So when we read that psalm, we're looking at uh, praising God in everything. But the greatest element that we see through this is that it is orchestrated praise. So even as we're coming to church, you know, our goal should be that we've come tonight to praise God. Uh, when we get up in the morning, we should be orchestrating that our day is to praise God. The things in our life is to praise God. Let me read the next uh, uh, paragraph. It kind of brings us to a new place, and I like this. Music is used in the Bible to call people to worship. To call uh, people to worship. In war, in war, W-A-R, to defend, the, to defeat the enemy, and drive out evil spirits. In war, to defeat the enemy and to drive out evil spirits. <clears throat> to worship God and all His creation. God ordained. God ordained music. God ordained music as a very prominent P-R-O-M-I-E-P-R-O-M-I-N-E-N-T. -E -E sorry. As a very prominent form of worship. Music is used in prophesying. I want to turn back there. I want to read that. First Chronicles 25.1. Listen to this. <coughs> Moreover, David and the captain of the host separated uh, to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Hermon and of Judithum who should prophesy with harps, with psalteries, and with cymbals, and the number of the workmen according to their service was. He says here that they should prophesy with harps, with psaltery, and with cymbals. Now let me ask you, when we see that word, when we see that word prophesy, you may say, well, I've never really seen people sing and prophesy. So there's a few ways that we can look at this this evening. Some people might say, well, they're in the Spirit, they begin to sing and they give a prophecy. But how about we look at tonight as in this as well, that there is such a thing as Spirit-led singing. Do you believe in that tonight? Spirit-led singing. Don't you love when the song leader gets up and you know the Holy Ghost has already been at work in their life directing them and the, the orchestrating of the service and what songs they should sing. So the Holy Ghost is nudging them for the songs and they're feeling it. The Spirit of God is working and moving in their life. And then they begin to lead and worship and then all of a sudden people just begin to sing. And it's very Spirit-led. It's not just words from the hymnals or words that we know from the course, but it is very Spirit-led. It's from the depth of the soul. It is worship and it is really singing in such a spiritual way that, it, that that's spirit led and it can be uh, prophetic as well amen thank God for spirit led singing amen and it's a form of worship uh, worship the spirit of God's got to get in it for it to really be and so uh, thank God that here are these individuals 4,000 of them they're broke up into 24 different courses uh, we find it and they'll be singing uh, in, in weekly periods and here it is that it's different, the, the, the temple is different than that of the tabernacle. Uh, because uh, we, we find that worship is escalated to a new level. And so uh, here it is, the tabernacle, the temple, and now we really can escalate because we have the work of Christ on the cross, and we have the Spirit of God moving in our services. Amen. So we can really know what it's like to have Spirit-led worship. Amen. Thank God for that. Singing worship with spirit. 
Whether we sing or play instruments, we need to strive for purity. Purity in our lives, our actions, and our thoughts. Really, the bottom line of worship is purity. God wants us to lift up holy hands. God wants our hearts to be pure as we worship Him. David in Psalms 51, uh, he talks about that condition of the heart. Uh, God, I want my heart condition to be good because I want to be good worship to you. Someone read Luke 16, verse 15. Someone have that? Luke 16, 15. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among, among men is the abomination of the set of God. Amen. So the three words are justify, knoweth, and sight. So, you know, we live in a day and age where someone may say, well, that's okay. We live in a world where we are really, really, really connected. I mean, we are networked more than we've ever been before. I mean, talking about a bridge of people, of, of, of uh, you know, our families, our network, because, you know, we have telephones, that we can call anytime. Uh, we have text messages, we have email, we have uh, Facebook, <laughs> we have all these things to connect us. And sometimes there are people, and not just sometimes, but you can pretty much say all the time, there is always going to be someone who's going to say, well, that's okay, God loves you as you are, God accepts it, it'll be all right. And so we have people that are going into churches and, and they're thinking, well, I'm accepted by man. And so they think, well, if man accepts it, God accepts it. Well, God's standard is higher than man's standard. Amen. And so, you know, uh, no matter what anyone else says, God is looking for the purity of our heart. No matter if it's acceptable with men, God doesn't esteem abomination high. He, an abomination to God is an abomination. Amen. Even if men esteem it highly. And, and let's read the next paragraph. We may fool others, we may fool others, and even justify ourselves. Justify ourselves when we compare our actions to others. But God sees our hearts. He knows. He knows whether or not our motives are pure. You know, we can fool others. We can deceive others. We can present. We can sometimes even fool ourselves. But we won't fool God. God sees our motives. And so worship is really about what the motives are before God. Someone read Psalm 78, verse 35 through 37. So let me give you these words quickly. Amen. The first one is nevertheless they did flatter, F-L-A-T-T-E-R, them, or God, with their mouth, M-O-U-T-H, and they lied, L-I-E-D, unto them, unto him with their tongues, for their heart was not right. <coughs> you know, folks can come in and flatter God with all kinds of things. Now don't get me wrong. God is a merciful God. And God is slow to wrath. And God is patient. And God is working a work in us. But when people blatantly disobey God, when they live life the way that they want versus the way God's Word says, then they come in and they flatter God thinking that it's acceptable because they fool men and they think that they're fooling God. But the Word of God says that they were not steadfast in their covenant with Him. Real worship is for men and women 
the Lord steadfast in a covenant with him. What's a covenant? It's an agreement, right? So I say to you, Sister Doc, I'll pay you $20 if you come and mow my grass and rake it up. So you come and mow my grass and rake it up. You keep your end of the covenant. But if I don't give you the 20 bucks, then I broke the covenant. And I can flatter you, and I can say all kinds of things. The covenant's broken if I don't hold up with my end of the covenant. Let me tell you, God will always hold up with his end of the covenant. Amen. But we need to be careful that we're holding up with our end of the covenant. It's a covenant of grace, but it's not grace to do whatever we want. It's grace that we're set free from the things that once bound us. How many times do we go through the motions, the motions, but our heart is not right? We are good at acting the part, but our lives are not right. Our actions speak louder, louder than our words to God and to everyone around us. How many has ever, don't, don't raise your hand, but how many has ever found yourself just going through the motions? I can raise my hand and say that I have. Now, there's times I've gone through the motions because I don't really necessarily feel it, not because I'm bad, but there's also times that I've gone through the motions because I'm just not connected the way that I should be with God. God is not looking for us to go through the motions of worship. God is looking for us to be obedient, and our obedience brings worship to Him. Someone uh, read Psalms 78, verse 38 and 39. Actually, you know what? Let me read my paragraph if you want to say this before. We need to repent. We need to repent and strive harder to please God. He is a merciful God. Does someone want to read Psalms 78? Verse 38, 39, even if you just read it, I'll give you the words. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh. A wind that passes away and comes not again. Hey, man, aren't you glad for a merciful God? Who, even when we go through the motions, you know, he wants us to repent and to have a heart check. And he doesn't consume us because he knows that we're just the wind that passeth away, he said. And so the next verse says, the, uh, the psalm uh, refers to, children, to the children of Israel, God's chosen people. We are his chosen through salvation. And we flounder, F-L-O-U-N-D-E-R. We flounder just like they did. We all flounder. If we don't think that we're, we're fully there sometimes, you know, you just have to say, I'm sorry, I've done, and God, I've done wrong. I've messed up. But we have to get our place so back to the place where we're not just going through the motions. And it's not just an act, but it, it's real worship. Let's make sure that our praising and worshiping our mighty God is not just an act. Not just an act. It must become a lifestyle. We cannot afford to go through the emotions and make an appearance. Go through the emotions and make an appearance and not be right in our hearts. You know, really, Christianity is a lifestyle. How many people do you know that are either on a budget or a diet or they change something about their life and they do it for a season, but it, it's only a short season because it never becomes a lifestyle. How many times have we seen folks come to church and they're, they're kind of like a, 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 an automatic vehicle? Uh, brother brother uh, 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 Chester Heath, I'll never forget him using this in, in uh, 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 Monday morning chapel. He said, they're engaged and they're disengaged and they're engaged and they're disengaged. You know, folks can be like that. They can be on fire for God and engaged and then they're disengaged. God wants us to be an automatic. He wants us to be engaged with Him. He wants us to make sure our worship isn't just something that we're engaged and disengaged in, but it's a lifestyle. 
So we, can we get up in the morning and we worship God? You know, maybe as you're, you're, you're getting up in the morning, going through your routine, stretching, yawning, grabbing a cup of coffee, racing out the door. Amen. Part of our routine needs to be that we are worshiping God. Because it becomes our lifestyle. One commentator has declared that if our hearts are not right and our worship is not true worship, the devil steals that worship and he heaps it upon himself. He steals that worship. The devil does want that worship, doesn't he? That was the whole problem to begin with. That's why it was cast down, because of pride. He wanted what was only worthy to be given to God. And he's still trying to steal it. Don't let him steal your worship. We may deceive, we may deceive ourselves, and we may deceive others. We may deceive ourselves and we may deceive others, but we will never, ever, ever convince God. Convince God. Listen to this sentence. I love this one. I've read this over and over as I was studying. When it comes to the end of life, whose impression? of us matters most. Wow. You know, we try to impress others. We've done that, all of us. You know, you, 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 uh, all of those of you that are in here that's ever been married, you try to impress someone. And you must have. You got married. And we should still be trying to impress one another, right? Sure. But most of all, in our life, in our lifestyle, we should be trying to be pressed up by our worship. Because at the end of life, that's the only impression that matters. I shared about Barbara Bush, and wow, what a legacy that lady has, has given. No matter what the dirty rotten that uh, the California college that belittled her, <coughs> that should have been fired from her job for her crudeness. But really, Barbara Bush impacted so many people. I mean, you just read about her legacy and her death. You know what? It didn't matter really who she impressed. When she drew her final breath, that most of all she impressed God. And that's what she was trying to impress. Someone read John 12, verse number 43. Yes, that's correct. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Neither can we afford worship to become a ritual. Do any of you have any rituals in your life? Sure you do. Probably every one of you have a ritual that you get up in the morning and brush your teeth. Probably before you go to bed, your ritual is you brush your teeth. You wash your face, brush your teeth, wash your hands. Hopefully, after you go to the bathroom, it's original to wash your hands. <laughs> now, if not, I'm going to talk to you. You need to. <laughs> Whatever your ritual is, you know, um, everybody has a miracle in their lives. But, what's that? It's, it's probably your morning ritual, isn't it, whether you lie. And, and if you forget the ritual, I'm sure he let you know. <laughs> <laughs> But, but worship has to be more than a ritual. We raise our hands, we mutter a few words, but our thoughts are far away, far away from God. Far away from the God we're going to be worshiping. Let me tell you a little secret. I, I only know my life, uh, so that's why I use my illustrations. I know everybody has. But um, I. I, I, I Bella on Sunday morning and tonight she did something that I just love. She has become a little ritual that she had her book on her lap Sunday morning. She first time saw all this. And um, she did it tonight. And she's sitting there. She doesn't know the words for something, but she's, but you know what? She's already learning worship. Now it might be a ritual right now because that's what we do in church. But I pray that someday it's more. It's a reality in our lifestyle. 
But we all can fall into the ritual because we're used to coming to church and doing that. But it has to be more than a ritual. It has to be a lifestyle. Whether we choose to worship, whether it be clapping, leaping, dancing, shouting, running, singing, playing an instrument, giving, etc., make sure it's from your heart. From your heart. The act of true worship must be exhibited from the heart. How can it be true if it's not? Make everything you do, everywhere you go, everything you say, be an act of worship. God will make it worth it. Everything I do, I do it for the Lord. Everything I give, I give as unto the Lord. This way that I live, I live it for the Lord, everything, all the way, for the glory of God. You know, there are some folks who there are different things that they do in their life, and maybe it's different than other people, but they do it because it's an act of worship for them to God. We don't need to walk on hot coals to prove our love for God. We don't need to uh, do something that, that, that is off the wall. God is just asking us to withhold. And that should be our act of worship to God. Can you go and pass these out to everybody? I'm not going to go very far in this. In fact, I'm going to try to stop in 10 minutes. Not wait. Kind of wrap things up. The criticism of worship. The criticism of worship. In the preceding lesson, we discussed different ways to worship. We all express our worship in different ways. This is very good, very true. Some cry. <coughs> some cry. Some laugh. Some are loud. Some are quiet. Some shout, some dance, some kneel, some give offerings, some jump, jump, some run, some sway, some squeal, some cheer. I never heard this one before, but this was interesting. Some whistle. <coughs> Most of us use more than one form of worship during our spiritual walk. The way we choose, the way we choose, choose to worship may depend <coughs> upon various circumstances. Once again, everybody is different. Everybody worships in their way. And probably some of these things that I've, I've read, some of you have experienced 90% of them, maybe 100% of those things because at different circumstances, different times in your life, you respond differently in your worship. Our personalities, our personalities, P-E-R-S-O-N-A-L-I-T-I-E-S, our personalities are a determining factor. Aren't you glad that we're all made different? You know, some are more outgoing, some are more introverted, some like cars, some like sewing, some like uh, uh, whatever. Whatever it may be, everybody is different. Some people may be like uh, bluegrass. That's you, bless your heart. That's not my forte. 
And we're all different. Our personalities are determining factors. Our teaching and the way we were raised, raised can be another factor. Our emotional level and what we are going through can determine how we will worship. What do you think that means? Our emotional, our emotional. Uh, uh, let me. I just lost my place. Our emotional level. What do you think that can mean? Some people are more emotional, some people are not. How about, do we ever have different types and times of emotion in our life? What's going to happen if you found out that you're getting a tax return bigger than you ever got before? <laughs> you're going to be happy, right? So you're probably going to be smiling, jumping. What if you were just given some really bad news that you didn't think you like? Some may cry, others may not express their emotion that way, but you may be sad. But when you come into church, you carry all that in. So if you just got the best news ever and you're happy, boy, you might just be laughing and jumping and shouting because that is the emotional level that you're on. Or maybe you got, and the Spirit of God begins to move, and then you're just broke. You just let it all out. It is worship by bringing your, your needs, your petitions. So, you know, we are made different, but we also have different emotional levels in our life. And so it may affect how we worship. And so our personalities, you know, uh, you know, some people may, maybe you, you were talking more quiet, and so maybe that's ingrained in you. And maybe that's who you are. And so maybe you worship in a more quiet way. Maybe some of you are, uh, uh, come from a family where you're loud and crazy and, you know, when I moved here, I wasn't used to some of that, you know, but, but we did have some folks, you know, that they were a little louder. So that, that took a little bit, you know, adjusting, you changing gears, you know, but that's how hot people's raised. It really isn't it? So don't we bring that into our worship, who we are? And so there's all kinds of things. And the bottom line is this. We do make a choice how we worship. Sometimes we may say, man, I just felt right. I don't want to choose to run. Maybe you say, I just choose to let the tears run. However it is, I choose to be quiet. I choose to be loud. I don't care what your choice is. Just allow God to be worshipped through the medium of who you are. All the descriptions listed above are expressions, expressions we use to de uh, de uh, demonstrate worship, the worship that is being lived in our lives. Each of us chooses the act or expression of worship that we want to display, that we want to display. Why do we criticize? Why do we criticize someone else for choosing an act of worship different than ours. You know, there should never, ever, 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 ever be any type of criticism or any type of making fun of how someone would worship. We don't want to hinder God moving in someone's life. We don't want to hinder someone from worshiping. I really don't care if you lift your hands low, middle, or high. I don't care about worship. Everybody's different. I don't care if you're demonstrative or you're quiet. That's not mine to choose. Now, I do believe when the Holy Ghost gets all over you, you're probably going to be demonstrative. I'll tell you what, you come over here and stick your finger in the outlet, I bet you'll be dancing around. <laughs> let, the, let, let the power of the Holy Ghost get upon you. You'll probably dance and shout around, bottom line. But, I, but it's no one's. It's no one's right, and no one should be critical of how someone else worships. Because that's their expression to God of who they are, how they are, and their worship. 
if it's done decently and in order and properly. Let me say that. I don't even feel like I'm dealing with those boundaries tonight. We know them here. I'm just talking about we should allow people to display who they are in Christ. Because God makes us all different. I'm done. I'm not even going to go because I have one minute and I'm going to start anything a little bit farther. Does anyone have anything they want to say about what we've talked about tonight? I'm trying not to go back and be redundant. <coughs> Thank you.